In November 1959, just over a decade into the National Party's rule, Elias Makhashule was born in Tumaho, a township in Paris, north of the Free State Province. He got his nickname Ace from his good soccer skills. Ace was born into a generation of activists determined to destroy the oppressive government that governed through racist laws. Raised by a single parent, Mahashwila was encouraged by his mother to do anything that made him happy. He gradually became aware of the ANC and his consciousness was ignited when the Soweto uprising of 1976 spread to Tumaho. After matriculating in 1980, he enrolled for a Bachelor of Arts at Fortier University and on 1 May 1982, he was arrested with 22 other students and charged with high treason in an attempt to assassinate the state president of Suske during the graduation ceremony. But this would not be the end of his encounter with law enforcement. In 1985, he spent nine months in solitary confinement. After he was released only two years later, in 1987, he enrolled for a law degree at Wits and later changed to a marketing course through the University of South Africa. It was during this time that he became known as someone who liked to show off cash and was good at tapping into sources of funding. Some struggle activists suspected him for stealing money that was meant for the liberation movement. The unbanning of the ANC came with optimism in the liberation movement and in preparation for the first elective conference after the unbanning, the Free State Province had some work to do in ironing out their differences. The province was divided into two political factions, the North and the South. Mahashule was part of the Northern faction. The national leadership of President Nelson Mandela favored the Southern faction. And when former President Thabo Mbeki took over the leadership from Mandela, he also shared Mandela's reservations about Ace Mahashule. Ace couldn't be trusted with money. Thus, the national leadership believed that he is not the man to lead the Free State. They feared that if elected as Premier, he would continue with his college habit of looting funds in the Free State. In 2007, as Tabombegi was looking for a third term as ANC President in December of that year, an elective conference was held in Buluguan, a heated contest for leadership between Begi and Zuma, saw Begi losing the race to Zuma. Fortunately for Ace, he supported Zuma, and with the victory, a space for political office opened for him. Mahashwila was appointed Free State Premier in May 2009, at the beginning of the Jacob Zuma era as the country's president. But before his appointment as Premier, early in 2000, the rivalry between the two North and Southern factions in the Free State caused much unrest in the province. It became so serious that the ANC national leadership had to intervene. And so they brought in an outsider to bring order to the chaotic province. Before his appointment by the Mbegi-led administration, Nobi returned to South Africa from his short stay in Sweden where he worked as a program officer. When Nobi arrived in his home province, the national government placed him in positions that marked him as an enemy of the Mahashule faction. Nobi tried to reconcile the two warring groups. He quickly established himself as an official who respected rules and laws that governed public bodies. True to his ideals, he suspended department directors over financial irregularities. Nobi also introduced a financial restructuring plan. His plan did not sit well with the two factions. Both factions saw him as someone taking money away from them. Not long after the implementation of the financial plan, calls came from both the North and the South that Nobi had to go. For the first time, the two groups became united under this one common goal. Nobi Ngombani started fearing for his life. One day after coming back from work, Nobi found his family enjoying a quiet autumn evening. While his family was eating dinner, a car stopped in front of the house and so Ngombane went outside with his daughter to inspect. The next thing heard was two gunshots and a brief pause. 
and more gunshots fired in quick succession. Everyone inside ducked for cover. When the shooting was over, Ngombane's daughter quickly came back in the house, but her father was lying face down and not moving. Ngombane was hit with two bullets and was rushed to surgery. One bullet hit his heart and pierced the aorta, leading to profuse bleeding. The surgeons tried to save him, but it was too late. When the police came to interview Ngombane's wife, they did not perform crucial and yet standard practice procedure for the murder investigation. So it turns out that the first thing police do in a crime scene where someone is shot is to get any potential suspect's hands for a gunpowder residue. This is never done. It would later turn out that a high-level cover-up was planned to protect the real culprit and to make Nobby's wife the scapegoat. The City Press published a story that pointed Nogwanda as the main suspect. The newspaper reported that she made insurance inquiries 10 days before her husband was killed. It was obvious that the police provided the information to the newspaper as this information deals with the investigation. An embarrassing attempt was made by the police to sue the grieving widow with her family. The then police commissioner, Jackie Selebe, told the public that they have triple-checked all the facts and that the evidence led to Nogwanda and her family. Nogwanda was arrested and charged with not being Gombani's death. It was during this time that the police started feeding the media with sensational information to show why Nogwanda wanted her husband dead. In a desperate attempt to find evidence to implicate Ngombane's widow, the police exhumed Ngombane's body after receiving information that Nogwanda hid the gun that killed her husband in the coffin. A search of the coffin and a body x-ray revealed no firearm. However, the state went on to charge her with the murder despite the poor evidence, only to shamefully withdraw the charges two years later. To this day, no one has been charged with this top-level political hit. When Ace became Free State Premier in May 2009, he announced that his administration would build bigger and better houses. These houses would be 50 square meters in size, an improvement to the existing 40 square meters. And in order to achieve the goal of building bigger houses, the Premier wanted new contractors to be employed. This was a smart move to remove old contractors with new businessmen that were connected to Mahashule, and this would see him benefiting from this project. 361 companies were tasked with building the houses. Of the 361, 350 companies were not properly registered as construction companies. The Premier handpicked contractors that he had business relations with. This resulted in new contractors who have never bought a house before. Now, all of a sudden, they had a 17 million rand contract to build 200 houses. Some contractors took their first payment from the government and bought cars and parted like there was no tomorrow. Other contractors were paid for houses that were never built. Others started the project and later abandoned it. Of the few houses that were built, the contractors were cutting corners and low quality material was used some houses started falling apart in just two years. Instead of delivering on his promise to build bigger and better houses, Mahashula facilitated one of the largest low-cost housing scandals the country has ever seen, leaving hundreds of unfinished RDP houses and millions in the pockets of his business partners. A sad legacy for a politician who labelled himself as a champion of the poor. With the country struggling, with high unemployment. Instead of creating jobs, we're about to see how top government officials in the free state were destroying existing jobs through their questionable conduct. When many South Africans were shocked that the private jet carrying Gupta wedding guests landed at the Waterkloof Air Force Base, in the background, a dairy farm in the small town of Frieda was used to finance the extravagant wedding. The public was told that the dairy farm was to help alleviate the country's unemployment problem. But this was far from the truth. The dairy farm was used to funnel more than 80 million of the Estina earnings through a series of shell companies in the United Arab Emirates. Of this fortune, 
30 million made its way back to South Africa to help settle the debt for the lavish wedding at Sun City. In the Free State Province, asbestos sheets in a large number of old township houses have deteriorated to great extents with cracks and breakages, most likely to release dust particles into the air, causing asbestos-associated diseases. <coughs> the provincial government allocated 255 million rands for the asbestos project, and of this amount, only 3% was spent on the project. The rest of the money went to the premier's business people who spent the money lavishly on cars, while people in the province were still living in asbestos houses. Mahashula's control of the hawks and the police is not limited to the Free State borders. When he rose to the position of Secretary General of the ANC, so did his connections in the Free State Police Service. To ensure that his protection continued after leaving the province, senior Free State Police officers were promoted to the national police structures. This ensured that the former Premier remains untouchable. And that's the main message that I got when reading Gangster State. If you like the content and want your favorite book to be reviewed next, let us know in the comment section below.